Hi, I'm Daryl Bricker. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Ipsos Public Affairs, arguably the largest uh, polling organization in the world. So we know a little bit about the topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is polling for journalists. What you need to know about those polls that are increasingly crossing your desk. Uh, Today, if you're a journalist, you're working on a 24-hour news cycle, you're inundated by information that's coming in, you have to make fast decisions about what's going to be making it into your news broadcast that night or what's going to be making it into your newspaper. And when it comes to polls, sometimes it's pretty hard to tell what's good and what's not. Increasing number of methodologies from people that you may know, people that you may not know, there's some basic questions that you should be asking, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this series. Very basic, no BS, bottom line questions that a journalist should be asking about any poll that comes in because you know what you have a right to know. Today's clip is about waiting. Why do I want to talk about waiting? Well I've seen more wonky things when it comes to waiting over the last little while than I've seen in a long time. Part of that's probably due to the fact that there's so many different methodologies being used to collect data these days, especially uh, interactive voice recording or robocalls. And they get some pretty strange samples out of field and I want to show you what that looks like and why that's a problem and what you should be asking as a journalist. And in particular what I'd be uh, focusing on are those polls in which it shows something that's really unusual, something that you don't expect, or something that comes in from someone that you've never heard of before, particularly if it's a, a methodology that you're uncomfortable with. I think it's a perfectly legitimate question to ask, show me your weighted and your unweighted data and show me how you correct it. So I'm going to show you what that actually means in terms of correcting weighted and unweighted data. So imagine we did a survey, here's one that looks like a survey, in which one of the categories that we looked at was age. And these are the age categories across the top, 18 to 25, 26 to 45, 46 to 65, 65 plus. And what happened when they were in field is they actually ended up with a sample that looked like this. 10 in the first category, 30 in the second category, 25 in the third category, 35 in the next category. But they know that in the real population, it's an equivalent number at each category. So it's 25, 25, 25, 25, which adds up to 100. What somebody would do if they were waiting to correct for a problem in terms of the representativeness of the sample is they'd adjust it to this. Now, as you can see, there's very little resemblance between what they actually got out of field and what they say the survey is. When somebody makes those types of adjustments, you really should have a good look at that. And the reason for that is because this is almost like creating interviews or subtracting interviews in certain senses and giving way more importance to certain groups of the population that may actually not be representative. That's why I keep banging on, if you follow me on Twitter, about show me your unweighted data, show me your weighted data. I want to see how you've made those adjustments. The next thing is I want to know how many different variables you did that for. I want to know if you did it for gender, I want to know if you wanted, did it for income, I want to know if you did it for age, I want to know if you did it for education. Whatever the variables were that you were weighting against should be disclosed, not just to say we weighted it to represent the general population. I want to know how many different ways you did it. The next thing I'd want to know is any non-demographic variables. Did you weight according to previous vote? Did you weight according to likelihood of turnout? Did you weight according to anything else that doesn't have anything to do with demographics? They should disclose that and they should show what the impact is. And if anybody tells you that they have a secret sauce or that there's a secret approach that they have to doing this or a proprietary approach, that is not allowed. They have to tell you what they've done. That doesn't mean that you have to report any of their trade secrets, but at the minimum to get coverage from you, they should at least tell you how that they weighted their data. And here's the big question that I have for all of these strange polls that seem to be coming out these days. What did you actually end up with on vote in your unweighted data? And how much did you correct to create the vote that you're reporting? To me, if there's a massive amount of change between what they got out of field and what they reported, that has no resemblance to what a real survey or a real poll should look like. It doesn't mean that it's not worth looking at, but that's not a poll, that's a model. That's somebody's estimate of what they think the real world is going to do, rather than something that's being generated as a result of the public opinion information that they got from their survey. 
All of these questions are pretty straightforward. They've taken me about three minutes to repeat to you, so I know they're easy to ask. I would implore journalists to start doing that, asking these basic questions about any surveys in which the numbers look different than the regular trend, or they don't seem quite correct, or they're from somebody that you really don't know and understand. Because you know at the end of the day, you have a right to know.